novel The Kite Runner by Khalid Husaini chapter number 25 They won't let me in I see them wheel him through a set of double doors and I follow I burst through the doors the smell of iodine and peroxide hits me but I all I have time to see is two men wearing surgical caps and a woman in green hurdling over a gurney A white sheet spills over the side of the gurney and the brushes again the grimy checkered tiles a pair of small bloody feet poke out from under the sheet and i see that a big toy nail on the left foot is chipped then a tall thick set man in blue presses his palm against my chest and he is pushing me back out through the doors his wedding band cold on my skin i show forward and i curse him but he says you cannot be here he says it in english his voice polite but firm you must wait he says leading me back to the waiting area and now the double doors swing shut behind him with a sigh and all i see is the top of the men's surgical cap through the doors narrow rectangular windows He leaves me in a wide windowless corridor crammed with the people sitting on metallic folding chairs set along the walls others on the thin frayed carpet I want to scream again and I remember the last time I felt this way riding with the baba in the tank of the fuel truck buried in the dark with the other refugees I want to tear myself from the this place from this reality rise up like a cloud and float away melt into this humid summer night and dissolve somewhere far over the hills but i am here my legs block of concrete my lungs empty of air my throat burning there will be no floating away there will be no other reality tonight i close my eyes and my nostrils fill with the smells of corridor sweet and ammonia rubbing alcohol and curry on the ceiling moths fling themselves at the dull gray light tubes running the length of the corridor and i hear the papery flapping of their wings i hear chatter muted sobbing sniffing someone moaning someone else sighing elevator doors opening with a bing the operator paging someone in urdu i open my eyes again and i know what i have to do i look around my heart a jack hammer in my chest blood thudding in my ears there is a dark litter supply room to my left in it i find what i need it will do i grab a white bed sheet from the pile of folded linens and carry it back to the corridor i see a nurse talking to a policeman near the restroom i take the nurse elbow and pull i want to know which way is west she doesn't understand and the lines on her face deepen when she frowns my throat X and my eyes sting with sweat each breath is like inhaling fire and i think i am weeping i ask again i beg the policeman is the one who points i throw my make shift jainamaz my prayers rug on the floor and i get on my knees lower my forehead to the ground my tears soaking through the sheet i bow to the west then i remember i haven't prayed for over 15 years i have long forgotten the words but it doesn't matter i will utter those few words i still remember la ilaha illallah muhammadur rasulullah there is no god but allah and muhammad is his messenger i see now that the baba was wrong there is a god there always had been i see him there in the eyes of the people in this corridor of respiration this is the real house of god this is where those who have lost god will find him not the white masjid with its bright diamond lights and towering minarets there is a god there has to be and now i will pray i will pray that he forgive that i have neglected him all of these years forgive that i have betrayed light and sin with impunity only to turn to him now in my hour of need i pray that he is as merciful benevolent and gracious as his book says he is i bow to the west and kiss the ground and promise that i will do zakat i will do namaz i will fast during ramadan and when ramadan has passed i will go on fasting i will commit to memory every last word of his holy book and i will set on a pilgrimage to that sweltering city in the desert and bow before the kaaba too i will do that all of this and i will think of him every day from this day on if he only grants me this one wish my hands are stained with hassan's blood i pray god doesn't let them get stained with the blood of his boy too i hear a whimpering and realize 
it is mine my lips are salty with the tears trickling down my face i feel the eyes of everyone in the corridor on me and still i bow to the west i pray i pray that my sins have not caught up with me the way i had always feared they would a starless black night falls over islamabad it's a few hours later and i am sitting now on the floor of tiny long of the corridor that leads to the emergency ward before me is a dull brown coffee table cluttered with newspaper and dog eared magazine and april 1996 issue of time a pakistani newspaper showing the face of young boy who was hit and killed by a train the week before an entertainment magazine with smelling hollywood actor on its glossy cover there is an old woman wearing a jet green shalwar kameez and a crocheting shawl knotted off in a wheelchair across from me everyone's In a while she stirs awake and mutters a prayer in Arab- Arabic. I wonder tiredly whose prayer will be heard tonight, hers or mine. I picture Surah's face, the pointed meaty chin, his small seashell ears, his slanting bamboo leaf eyes, so much like his father's, a sorrow as black as the night outside invades me and I feel my throat clamping. I need air. I get up and open the windows. The air coming through the screen is musty and hot. It smells of our ripe dates and dung. I force it into my lungs in big heaves, but it doesn't clear the clamping feeling in my chest. I draw back on the floor. I pick up the Time magazine and flip through the pages, but I can't read, can't focus on anything. So I toss it on the table and go back to staring at the zigzagging pattern of the cracks on the cement floor at the cob web on the ceiling ceiling where the f- walls meet other dead flies littering the windows sill mostly i stare at the clock on the wall it's just past 4 am and i have been shut out of the room with the swinging double doors for our 5 hours now i still haven't heard any news the floor beneath me begins to feel like part of my body and my breathing is growing heavier slower i want to sleep shut my eyes and lie my head down to this cold dusty floor drift off when i wake up maybe i will discover that everything i saw in the hotel bathroom was the part of my dream the water drops dripping from the faucet and landing with a plink into the bloody bath water the left arm dangling over the side of the tub the blood soaked razor sitting on the toilet tank the same razor i had shaved with the day before and his eyes still half open but light less that more than anything i want to forget the eyes soon sleep comes and i let it take me i dream of things i can't remember later some one is tapping me on the shoulder i open my eyes there is a man kneeling beside me he is wearing a cap like the man behind the swinging double doors and a paper surgical mask over his mouth my heart sinks when i see a drop of blood on the mask he has taped a picture of a doe-eyed little girl to his beeper he unsnaps his mask and i am glad i don't have to look at sorab's blood anymore his skin is dark like the imported swiss chocolate hassan and i used to buy from the bazaar in charai no he has thinning hair and hazel eyes topped with carved eyelashes in a british accent he tells me his name is dr nawaz and suddenly i want to be away from this man because i don't think i can bear to hear what he has come to tell me he says the boys had cut him deeply and had lost a great deal of blood and my mouth begins to mutter that prayer again la ilaha illallah muhammad rasulullah they had to transfuse several unit of red cells how will i tell suraya twice twice they had to revive him i will do namaz i will do zakat they would have lost him if his heart hadn't been young and strong i will fast he is alive Dr Nawaz smiles it takes me a moment to register what he has just said then he says more but i don't hear him because i have taken his hands and i have brought them up to my face i weep my relief into this stranger's small meaty hands and he says nothing now he waits the intensive care unit is all shaped and dim a jumble of a bleeping monitors and Whirring machines. Doctor Nawaz leads me between two rows of beds separated by white plastic curtains. Surab's bed is the last one around the corner, the one nearest the nurses' station, where two nurses in green surgical scrubs are jotting notes on clipboards, chatting in low voices. On the silent ride up the elevator with Doctor Nawaz, I had thought I would 
weep again then i saw sora but when i sit on the chair at the foot of his bed looking at the at his white face through the tangle of gleaming plastic tubes and four lines i am dry eyed watching his chest rise and fall to the rhythm of the hissing ventilator a curious numbness washes over me the same numbness a man might feel second after he has swerved his car and barely avoided a head on collisions i doze off and when i wake up i see the sun rising in a buttermilk sky through the window next to the nurse station the light slant into the room aims my shadow towards suraf he hasn't moved you would do well to get some sleep a nurse says to me i don't recognize her there must have been a shift change while i had napped she takes me to another lounge this one just outside the icu it's empty she hands me a pillow and a hospital issue blanket i thank her and lie on the vinyl sofa in the corner of the lounge i fall asleep almost immediately i dream i am back in the lo- lounge downstairs dr nawaz walks in and i rise to i rise to meet him up he takes off his paper mask his hands suddenly whiter than i remember his nails manicured he has neatly parted hair and i see he is no dr nawaz at all but raymond andrews the little embassy man with the potted tomatoes andrews cooks his head narrows his eyes in the day time the hospital was a maze of teeming angled hallways a blur of blazing white overhead floor fluorescence i came to know its layout came to know that the fourth floor button in the east wing elevator didn't light up that the door to the men's room on that same floor was jammed and you had to ram your shoulder into it to open it I came to know that hospital life has a rhythm the flurry of activity just before the morning shift change the mid day hustle the stillness and the quiet of the late night hours interrupted occasionally by a blur of doctor and nursing rushing to revive someone i kept vigil at sarab bedside in the daytime and wandered through the hospital serpentine tine corridors at the night listening to my shoe heels clicking on the tiles thinking of what i would say to sarab when he woke up i would end up back in the i and back in the icu by the Wishing ventilator beside the bed I would be no closer to knowing after 3 days in the ICU they withdrew the breathing tube and transferred him to a ground level bed I was not there when they moved him I had gone back to the hotel that night to get some sleep and ended up tossing around in bed all the night in the morning I tried to not look at the bathtub it was clean now someone had wiped off the blood spread new flower floor mats on the floor and scrubbed the walls but i couldn't stop myself from sitting on its cool porcelain edge i pictured sara filling it with the warm water saw him undressing saw him twisting the razor handle and opening the twin safety latches on the head sliding the blade out holding it between his thumb and four forefinger i pictured him lowering himself into the water laying there for a while his eyes closed i wonder what his last thought had been as he had raised the blade and brought it down i was exiting the lobby when the hotel manager mr fias caught up with me i am very sorry for you he said but i am asking for you to leave my hotel please this is bad for my business very bad i told him i understood and i checked out he didn't charge me for the 3 days i had spent at the hospital waiting for a cab outside the hotel lobby i thought about what mr fias had said to me that night we had gone looking for sarab the thing about you one is is that while well, you people are a little reckless i had laughed at him but now i wondered had i actually gone to sleep after i had given sarab the news he feared more most when i got in the cab i asked the driver if he knew my persian bookstores he said there was one a couple of kilometers south we stopped there on the way to the hospital sarab's new room had cream colored walls chipped dark gray moldings and glass tiles that might have once been white he shared the room with a teen aged punjabi boy who i later learned from one of the nurses had broken his leg when he had slipped off the roof of a moving bus his leg was in a cast raised and held by tongs strapped to several weights sarab's bed was next to the window the lower half lit by the late morning sunlight streaming through the rectangular panes a uniformed security guard was standing at the window 
munching on cooked watermelon seeds for hours under 24 hours a day suicide watch hospital protocol dr nawaz had informed me the guard tipped his head when he saw me and left the room Sora was wearing short sleeved hospital pajamas and laying on his back blanket pulled to his chest face turned to the window i thought he was sleeping but when i scooted a a chair up to his bed his eyelids fluttered and opened he looked at me then looked away he was so pale even with all the blood they had given him and there were a large purple bruise in the crease of his right arm how are you i said he didn't answer he was looking through the window at a fenced in sandbox and swing set in the hospital garden there was an arc shaped trellis near the playground in the shadow of a row of high bicus trees a few green vines climbing up the timber lattice a handful of kids were playing with the buckets and the pails in the sandbox the sky was a cloudless blue that day and i saw a tiny jet leaving behind twin white trails i turned back to sorab i spoke dr nawaz a few minutes ago and he thinks you will be discharged in a couple of days that's a good news na Again I was met by silence the Punjabi boy at the other end of the room st- stood in his sleep and moaned something I like your room I said trying not to look at Sarab's bandaged wrists it's bright and you have a view silence a few more a- awkward minutes passed and a light sweat formed on my brow my upper lip I pointed to the untouched bowl of green pea ash on his nightstand the unused plastic spoon you should try to eat something gain your quart back your stand do you want me to help you he held me glass he looked away his face set like stone his eyes were still lightless i saw i saw vacant the way i had found them when i had pulled him out of the bath tub i reached into the paper bag between my feet and took out the used copy of shahnama i had both at the persian bookstore i turned the cover so it faced sorab i used to read this to your father when we were children we used to go up the hill by our house and sit beneath the pomegranate i trailed off sorab was looking through the window again i forced a smile your father's favorite was the story of rustam and sorab and that's how you got your name i know you dad I paused feeling a bit like an idiot anyway he said in his letter that it was your favorite too so I thought I would read you some of it would you like that so Rob closed his eyes covered them with his arm the one with the bruise I flipped to the page I had bent in the taxi cab here we go I said wondering for the first time what thought had passed through Hassan's head when he had finally read the Shahnama for himself and discovered that I had deceived him all those times I cleared my throat and read give give ear unto the combat of Sorab against Rustam though it be a tale replete with tears i began i it, it came about that and certain day rustam rose from his couch and his mind was filled with forebodings he he bethought him i read him most of chapter 1 up to the part where the young warrior sorab comes to his mother tahmina the princess of semigan and demands to know the identity of his father i closed the book do you want to me to go on There are battles coming up remember Sorab leading his army to the white castle in Iran should i read on he shook his head slowly i dropped the book back in the paper bag that's fine i said and courage that he had responded at all maybe we can continue tomorrow how do you feel Sorab's mouth opened and a hoarse sound came out Dr Nawaz has told me that would happen on account of the breathing tube they had slid through his vocal cords he licked his lips and tried again tired I know Dr Nawaz said that was to be expected he was shaking his head what sora he winced when he spoke again in that husky voice barely above a whisper tired of everything i sighed and slumped in my chair there was a band of sunlight on the bed between us and for just a moment the ashen gray face looking at me from the other side of it was a dead ringer for hassan's not the hassan 
I played marbles with until the mulla belted out the evening azan and Ali called us home not the hasan I chased down over hill as the sun dipped behind clear rooftops in the west but the hasan I saw alive for the last time dragging his belongings between behind Ali in the warm summer downpour stuffing them in the trunk of baba's car while I watched through the rain soaked window of my room He gave a slow shake of his head tired of everything he repeated what can i do sir please tell me i want he began he winced again and brought his hand to his throat as if to clear whatever was blocking his voice my eyes were drawn again to his wrist wrapped tightly with the white gauze bandages i want my old life back he breathed Oh sarab i want father and mother jaan i want sasa i want to play with rahim khan sahib in the garden i want to live in our house again he dragged his forearm across his eyes i want my old life back i didn't know what to say where to look so i gazed down at my hands your old life i thought my old life too i played in the same yard sarab i lived in the same house but the grass is dead and the stranger's jeep is parked in the driveway of our house pissing oil all over the asphalt our old life is gone sarab and everyone in it either dead or dying it's just you and me now just you and me i can't give you that i said i wish you had not please don't say that wish you had not i wish you had left me in the water don't ever say that sarab i said leaning forward i can't bear to hear you talk like this i touched his shoulder and he flinched drew away i dropped my hand remembering ruefully how in the last days before i had broken my promise to him and he had finally become at ease with my touch so rab i can't give you your old life back i wish to god i could but i can't take you with me that was what i was coming in the bathroom to tell you you have a visa to go to america to live with me and my wife it's true i promise he sighed through his nose and closed his eyes i wish i had not said those last two words you know i have done a lot of things i regret in my life i said and maybe none more than going back to on the promise i made you but that will never happen again and i am so very profoundly sorry i ask for your bakshish your forgiveness can you do that can you for you forgive me can you believe me i drop my voice will you come with me As I waited for his reply my mind flashed back to the winter day from long ago Hasan and I sitting on the snow beneath a leafless sour cherry tree I had played a cruel game with Hasan that day tried with him ask him if he would chew dare to prove his loyalty to me now I was the one under the microscope the one who had to prove my worthiness I deserved this So Rab rolled to his side his back to me he didn't say anything for a long time and then just as i thought he might have drifted to sleep he said with a croak i am so khasta so very tired i sat by his bed until the he fell asleep something was lost between sorab and me until my meeting with the lawyer umar faisal a light of hope had begun to enter sorab's eyes like a a timid guest now the light was gone the guest had fled and i wondered when it would dare return i wondered how long before sorab smiled again how long before he trusted me if ever so i left the room and went looking for an other hotel unaware that almost a year would pass before i would hear sorab speak another word in the end sorab never accepted my offer nor did he decline but he knew that when the bandages were removed and the hospital garments returned he was just another homeless hazara orphan what choice did he have where could he go so what i took as a yes from him was in actuality more of quiet surrender not so much an acceptance as an act of the relinquishment by one too weary to dis- decide and far too tired to believe what he earned for was his old life what he got was me and america no that it was such a bad fit everything considered but i could not tell him that perspective was a luxury when you had was constantly buzzing with a swarm of demons and so it was that about a week later we crossed a strip of warm black 
Kara Mack and I both Hassan's son from Afghanistan to America lifting him from the certainty of turmoil and dropping him in a turmoil of uncertainty. One day maybe around 1983 or 1984 I was at a video store in Fremont. I was standing in the western section when a guy next to me sipping coke from a, a 7-Eleven cup pointed to the, the magnificent Seven and asked me if I had seen it just 13 times. I said, Charles Brunson dies in it. So, two jams, Coburn and the Robert Vaughn gave me a pinch face look as if I had just spat in his soda. Thanks a lot, man, he said, shaking his head and muttering something as he walked away. That was when I learned that in America you don't reveal the ending of the movie, and if you do, you will be scorned and made to apologize profusely for having committed the sin of spoiling the end. In Afghanistan, the ending was all that mattered. When Hassan and I came home after watching a Hindi film at Cinema Zainab, what Ali Rahim Khan Baba or the myriad of Baba's friends, second and third cousins, smiling in and out of the house, wanted to know was this. Did the girl in the film find happiness? Did the bache film, the guy in the film, become cut Nayab and fulfill his dreams or was he nap calm, doomed to wallow in the failure? Was there happiness at the end? They wanted to know. If someone were to ask me today whether the story of Hassan Sorab and me ends with happiness, I would not know what to say. Does anybody's after all life is not a Hindi movie? Zindagi Mikzara. Afghans like to say life goes on, unmindful of beginning and and kamyab na kama na kam crisis or cat arsis moving forward like a slow dusty caravans of coaches i would not know how to answer that question despite the matter of the last sunday's tiny miracle we arrived home about seven months ago on a warm day in august 2001 suraya picked us up at the airport i had never been away from the suraya for so long when she locked her arms around my neck when i smelled apples in her hair i realized how much i had missed her you are still the morning sun to me yelda i whispered what never mind i kissed her ear after she knelt to her I level with Sorab, she took his hand and smiled at him. Salam, Sorab Jan, I am your Khala Suraya. We have all been waiting for you. Looking at her, smiling at Sorab, her eyes tearing over a little. I had a glimpse of the mother she might have been, had her own womb not betrayed her. Sorab shifted on his feet and looked away. Suraya had turned the study upstairs into a bedroom for Sorab. She led him in and he sat on the edge of the bed. The sheets showed brightly colored cards flying in indigo blue skies she had made inscriptions or the wall by the closet feel and inches to measure a child's growing height at the foot of the bed i saw a wicker basket stuffed with books a locomotive a watercolor set sora was wearing the plain white t-shirt and new Danims. I had brought him in Islamabad just before we had left. The shirt hung loosely over his bony, slumming shoulder. The color still hadn't seeped back into his face, save for the halo of a dark circles around his eyes. He was looking at us now in the impassive way. He looked at the plates of boiled rice, the hospital orderly placed before him. Surya asked if he liked his room, and I noticed that she was trying to avoid looking at his wrists and that her eyes kept swaying. Back to the those it pink line. Sorab lowered his head, his hide his hands under his thighs and said nothing. Then he simply lay his head on the pillow. Less than the five minute later, Suraya and I watching from the doorway he was snoring. We went to bed and Suraya fell asleep with her head on my chest. In the darkness of our room, I lay awake and insomniac once again, awake and alone with with demons of my own, sometimes in the middle of the night, I slid out of bed and went to Sorab's rooms. I stood over him, looking down, and saw something protruding from under his pillow. I picked it up, saw it was Rahim Khan's Polaroid, the one I had given to Sorab. The night we had sat by the Shah Faisal Mosque, the one of the Hassan and Sorab standing side by side, squinting in the light of the sun and smiling like the world was a good and just a place. I wondered how long Sorab had lain in bed st staring at the photo, turning it in, in his hands. 
I looked at the photo. Your father was a man torn between two halves. Rahim Khan had said in his letter, "I had been been the entitled half the society approved, legitimate half the un unwitting." embodiment of baba's guilt i looked at the hasan showing those two missing front teeth sunlight slanting on his face baba's other half the untitled unprivileged half the half who had inherited what had been pure and noble in baba the half that may be in the most secret recesses of his heart baba had thought of as his true son i slipped the picture back where i had found it then i realized something that last thought had brought no sting with it closing sorab's door i wondered why if that was how of forgiveness but it not with the fanfare of ab if nay but with pain gathering its things packing up and slipping away unannounced in the middle of the night the journal and the khala jamila came over for dinner the following night khala jamila her Her hair cut short and a darker shade of red than a usual. Handed Surya the plate of almond topped mag hout she had brought for dessert. She saw Surab and beamed. Mashallah, Surya Jan told us how khush deep you were, but you are even more handsome in person, Surab Jan. She handed him a blue. Turtle neck sweater. I knitted this for you, she said. For next winter, inshallah, it will fit you. Sorab took the sweater from her. "Hello young man," was all the general said, leaning with both hands on his cane, looking at Sorab the way one might study a bizarre decorative item at someone's house. I answered and answered again Khala Jamila's question about my injuries. I had asked Surya to tell them I had been mugged, reassuring her that I had no permanent damage that the wires would come out in a few weeks so I would be able to eat her cooking again. But yes, I would try rubbing rhubarb juice and the sugar on my scars to make them fade faster. The gentleman and I sat in the living room and sipped wine. While Surya and her mother sat the table, I told him about Kabul and the Taliban. He listened and nodded his can on his lap and tested When I told him of the man I had spotted selling his artificial leg, I made no mention of the execution at Ghazi Stadium and Asif. He asked about Rahim Khan Wom. He said he had met in Kabul a few times and shook his head solemnly when I told him of Rahim Khan's illness. But as we spoke, I caught his eyes drifting again and again to Saraf sleeping on the couch as if we were. skirting around the edge of what he really wanted to know the skirting finally came to an end over the dinner when the general put down his fork and said so amir jan you are going to tell us why you have brought back this boy with you iqbal jan what sort of question is that khala jamila said while you are busy knitting sweaters and my dear i have to deal with the community Community's perception of our family. People will ask. They will want to know why there is Hazara boy living with our daughter. What do I tell them? Surya dropped her spoon, turned on her father. You can tell them. It's okay, Surya. I said, taking her hand. It's okay. Jana Sahib is quite right. People will ask. Amir she began. It's all right. I turned to the general. You see, Jana Sahib, my father slept with his servant's wife. She bore him a son named Hasan. Hasan is dead now. Dad boy sleeping on the couch is Hasan's son. He is my nephew. That's what you tell people when they ask. They were all staring at me. And one more thing, General Sahib, I said you will never again refer to him as a Hazara boy in my presence. He has a name and it's Sorab. No one said anything for the remainder of the meal. It would be erroneous to say Sorab was quiet. Quiet is peace. Tranquility. Quiet is turning down the volume knob on life. Silence is pushing the off button, shutting it down all of it. So rough silence was not the self-imposed silence of those with convictions of protesters who seek to speak their cause by not speaking at all. It was the silence of one who has taken cover in the dark place, curled up all the edges and tucked them under. He didn't so much live with us as occupy space and precious little of it. Sometimes at the market or in the park, I. 
would i had noticed how other people hardly seemed to even see him like he was not there at all i would look up from a book and i realized rab had entered the room had sat across from me and i had not noticed he walked like he was afraid to leave behind footprints he moved as if not to stir the air around him mostly he slept so rab's silence was hard on suraya to our dad long distant line to pakistan suraya had told me about the things she was planning for sarab swimming classes soccer bowling league now she would to walk past Sarab's room and catch a glimpse of books sitting unopened in the wicker basket, the growth chart, or mark the jigsaw puzzle unassembled. Each item a reminder of a life that could have been a reminder of a dream that was wilting even as it was budding. But she hadn't been alone. I I had my own dreams for Saurabh. While Saurabh was silent, the world was not. One Tuesday morning last September, the Twin Towers came crumbling down and overnight the world changed. The American flag suddenly appeared everywhere on the, the antennae of a yellow cabs weaving around traffic on the lapels of the pedestrians walking the sidewalks in a steady stream even on the grimy cabs of the San Francisco span handlers sitting beneath the the awnings of a small art galleries and open fronted shops. One day I passed Adit, the homeless woman who plays the accordion every day on the corner of Sutter and the Stockton and spotted an American flag sticker on the accordion case at her feet. Soon after the attacks, America bombed Afghanistan, the Northern Alliances moved in and the Taliban scurried like a rats into the cave. Suddenly, people were standing in the grocery store lines and talking about the cities of my childhood, Kandhar, Herat, mazar shiri When I was very little, Baba took Hassan and me to the Kundas. I don't remember much about the trip, except sitting in the shade of an, an acacia tree with the Baba and Hassan taking turns, sipping fresh watermelon juice from a clay pot and seeing who could spit the seeds farther. Now Dan rather Tom Broca and the people sipping lates at Starbucks were talking about the battle for Kandas, the Taliban's last stronghold in the north. That December, Pashtun, Tajiks, Uzbeks and the Hazaras gathered in the bone and under the watchful eye of the UN began the process that might someday end. Over 20 years of unhappiness in their vatan, Hamid Karzai's curl hat and the green chapan became famous. Saurabh's sleep walked through it all. Suraya and I became involved in Afghan project as much out of the sense of civil duty as the need for something, anything to fill the silence upstairs, the silence that sucked everything in like a black hole. I had never been the active type before, but when a man named Kabir, a former Afghan ambassador in to Sufia, called and asked if I wanted to help him with a hospital project, I said yes. The small hospital had stood near the Afghan-Pakistani border and had a small surgical unit that treated Afghan refugees with landmine injuries, but it had closed down due to the lack of funds. I became the project manager, Suraya, my co-manager. I spent most of my days in the study emailing people people around the world applying for grants, organizing fundraising events and telling myself that bringing Saurabh here had been the right thing to do. The year ended with Suraya and me on the couch, blankets spread over our legs, watching Dick Clark on TV. People cheered and kissed when the silver ball dropped and confetti whitened the screen. In our house, the new year began much the same way the last one had ended in the silence. Then four days ago on a cool rainy day in May 2002, a small wondrous thing happened. I took Suraya, Khala, Jamila and Saurabh to a gathering of Afghans at Lake Elizabeth Park in Fremont. The general had finally been summoned to Afghanistan the month before for a ministry position and had flown there two weeks earlier. He had left behind his grey suit and pocket watch. The plan was for Khala Jamila to join him in a few months once he had settled. She missed him terribly and worried about his health there and we had insisted she stay with us for a while. The previous Thursday, the first day of spring had been the Afghan New Year Day, the solid no and the Afghans in the Bay Area had planned celebrations throughout the East Bay and the Peninsula. Kabir, Suraya and I had an additional reason to rejoice. Our little hospital in Rawalpindi had opened the week before, not the surgical unit, just the 
pediatric clinic but it was a good start we all agreed it had been sunny for days but sunny sunday morning as i swung my legs out of the bed i heard rain drops pelting the windows afghan luck i thought snickered i prayed morning namaz while suraya slept i didn't have to consult the prayer pamphlet i had obtained from the mosque anymore the verses came naturally now effortlessly we arrived around noon and found a handful of people taking cover under a large rectangular plastic sheet mounted on a six post bike to the ground someone was already frying bolani steamed gross from tea cups and a pot of cauliflower ayush a scratchy old ahmed zahir song was blaring from a cassette player i smiled a little as the four of us rushed across the soggy grass field field suraya and i in the lead khala jamila in the middle sura behind us the hood of his yellow raincoat bouncing on his back what's so funny suraya said holding a folding folded newspaper over her head you can take afghans out of pagwan but you can't take pagwan out of the afghan i said we stopped under the makeshift tent suraya and khala jamila drifted toward an overweight woman frying spinach bolani sura stayed under the canopy for a moment then stepped back out into the rain hands stuffed in the pocket of his raincoat his hair now brown and straight like hassan's plastered against his scalp he stopped near a coffee color puddle and st- stared at it no one seemed to notice no one called him back in with time the queries about our our adopted and decidedly eccentric little boy had merciful sees and considering how tech tactless afghan queries can be sometimes that was a considerable relief people stopped asking why he never spoke why he didn't play with the other kids and best of all they stopped suffocating with their exaggerated empathy their slow head shaking their and their oh gong bichara oh poor little mute one the novelty had worn off like dull wallpaper sorab had blended into the background i shook hand with the kabir a small silver haired man he introduced me to a dozen men one of them a retired teacher another an engineer a former a architect or a surgeon who was now running a hot dog stand in Hayward they all said they had known baba in kabul and they spoke about him respectfully in one way or another way he had touched all their lives the man said i was lucky to have had such a great man for a father We chatted about the difficult and maybe the thankless job Karzai had in front of him about the upcoming Loya Jirga and the king's imminent return to his homeland after 28 years of exile. I remember the night in 1973 the night Zahir Shah's cousin overthrew him I remember gunfire and the sky li- lighting up silver Ali had taken me and Hasan in his arms told us not to be afraid that they were just shooting ducks the someone told a mullah nasiruddin joke and we were all laughing you know your father was a funny man to kabir said he was wasn't he i said smiling remembering how soon after we arrived in the us baba started grumbling about america flies he would sit at the kitchen table with his flies water why the flies darting from wall to wall buzzing here buzzing there hurried and rushed in this country even flies are pressed for time he had grown how i had laughed i smiled at the memory now by 3 o'clock the rain had stopped and the sky was a cur- curdled grave burdened with lumps of cloud a cool breeze blew through the park more families turned up afghan greeted each other hugged kissed exchanged food some one lighted coal in a barbecue and as soon the smell of garlic and the more kebab folded my no- senses there was a music some new singer i didn't know and the giggling of children i saw sorab still in his yellow raincoat leaning against a garbage bag staring across the park at the empty batting cage a little while later as i was chatting with the former surgeon who told me he and baba had been classmates in 8th grade suraya pulled on my sleeve i mean look she was pointing to the sky a half dozen kites were flying high speckles of bright yellow red and green against the gray sky check it out suraya said and this time she was pointing to a guy guy selling kites from a stand of nearby hold this 
I said I gave my cup of tea to Shreya I excused myself and walked over to the card stand my shoes squishing on the wet grass I pointed to the yellow sah parcha sale no mubarak the card seller said taking the 20 and handing me the card and a wooden spool of a glass star I thanked him and wished him a happy new year too I tested the string the way Hasan and I used to by holding it between my thumb and a four winker and pulling it it reddened with blood and the card seller smiled I smiled back I took the card to where Sara was standing still leaning against the garbage pails arms crossed on his chest was looking up at the sky do you like the sah parcha i said holding up the kite by the ends of the crossbar his eyes shifted from the sky to me to the kite then back a few rivulets of rain trickled from his hair down his face i read read once that in malaysia they use kites to catch the fish i said i will bet you didn't know that they tie a fishing line to it and fly it beyond the shallow water so it doesn't cast a shadow and scare the fish and in ancient china journals used to fly kites over battlefields to send message to their men it's true i am not slipping you a trick i showed him my bloody thumb nothing wrong with the tar either out of the corner of my eye i saw shreya watching us from the tent hands tensely dug in her armpits unlike me she would gradually abandon her attempts at engaging him the unanswered question the blank stares the silence it was all too painful she had shifted to holding pattern waiting for a green light from sarab waiting i wet my index finger and held it up i remember the way your father checked the wind was to kick up dust with his sandal see which way the wind blew it he knew a lot of little tricks like that i said lowered my finger west i think so i wiped a rain drop from his ear lobe and shifted on his feet said nothing i thought of sreya asking me a few months ago what his voice sounded like i had told her i didn't remember any more did i ever tell you your father was the best kite runner in wazir akbar khan maybe all of kabul i said noting the loose end of the spool tied to the string loop tied to the center spar how jealous he made the neighborhood kids he would run kites and never never look up at the sky and people used to say he was chasing the kite's shadow but they didn't know him like i did your father was not chasing any shadows he's just new and other half dozen kites had taken flight people had started to gather in clumps tea cups in hand eyes glued to the sky do you want to help me fly this i said sarab gaze bounced from the kite on to me back to the sky okay i shrugged looks like i will have to fly it then high solo i balanced the spool in my left hand and f- fed about 3 feet of tar the yellow kite dangled at the end of it just above the wet grass last chance i said but sura was looking at pair of kites dangling high above the trees all right here i go i took off running my sneakers splashing rain water from puddles the hand clutching the kite and of the string held high above my head it had been so long so many years since i had done this and i wondered if i I could make a spectacle of myself. I let the spool roll in my left hand as I ran, felt the string cut my right hand again as it fed through. The kite was lifting behind my shoulder now, lifting, wheeling, and I ran harder. The spool spun faster and the glass string tore and other gash in my right palm. I stopped and turned, looked up, smiled. High above my kite was tilting side to side like a pendulum, making that old paper bird flapping its wing around sound. I always associate associated with the winter mornings in kabul i hadn't flown a kite in a quarter of a century but suddenly i was 12 again and all the old instincts came rushing back i felt a presence next to me and looked down it was sorab hands dug deep in the pockets of his raincoat he had followed me do you want to try ask he said nothing but when i held the string out for him his hand lifted from his pocket hesitated took the string my heart quickened as i spun the spool to gather the loose string we stood quietly side by side next bent up 
around us kids chased each other slid on the grass someone was playing an old hindi movie soundtrack now a line of elderly men were praying afternoon namaz on a plastic sheet spread on the ground the air smelled of the wet grass smoke and grilled meal i wish time would stand still then i saw we had company a green kite was closing in i traced the string to a kid standing about 30 yards from us he had a crew cut and a t-shirt that read the rock rules in bold block letter he saw me looking at him and smiled waved i waved back so i was handing the string back to me are you sure i said taking it it took the spool from me okay i said let's give him a sabak teach him a lesson na I glanced over at him the glassy vacant look in his eyes was gone his gaze flitted between our kite and the green one his face was little flushed his eyes suddenly alert awake alive i wonder when i had forgotten that despite everything he was still just a child the green kite was making its move let's wait i said we will let him get a little closer it tipped twice and crept toward us come on come to me i said the green kite drew closer yet now ri- rising a little above us unaware of the trap i would set for it why sorab i am going to show you one of your father's favorite tricks the old lift and dive next to me sorab was breathing rapidly through his nose the spool rolled in his palms the t- tendons in his scarred wrists like rhubarb strings then i blink blinked away and for just a moment the hands holding the spool were the chipped nailed calloused hands of a hair lipped boy i heard a crow crying somewhere and i looked up the park shimmered with snow so fresh so dazzling white it burned my eyes it sp- sprinkled soundlessly from the branches of white clad trees i smelled turnip corina now dried mulberries sour oranges soft dust soft dust and the walnuts the muffled quiet snow quiet was deafening then far away across the stillness a voice calling us home the voice of a man dragged his right leg the green kite hovered directly above us now he is going for it any time now i said my eyes flicking from sarafs to our kite the green kite hesitated held position then shot down here's he comes i said i did it perfectly after all these year the old lift and the dive trap i loosened my green and tugged on the string dipping and dodging the green kite a series of quick side arm jerks and our kite shot up counter clockwise in a half circle suddenly i was on top the green kite was scrambling now panic stricken but it was too late i had already slipped him Hassan struck I pulled hard and our kite plummeted I could almost feel our string swaying his almost heard the snap then just like that the green kite was spinning and wheeling out of the control behind us people cheer whistles and applause broke out I was panting the last time I had felt a rush like the was that day in the winter of 1975 just after I had cut the last kite when I spotted baba on our rooftop clapping beaming i looked down at sora one corner of his mouth had curled up just so a smile loop sided hardly there but there behind us kids were scrambling and a melee of a screaming kite runners were chasing the loose kite drifting high above the trees i blinked and the smile was gone but it had been there i had seen it do you want me to run that kite for you His Adam's apple rose and fell as he swallowed the wind lifted his hair I thought I saw him nod for you a thousand times over I heard myself say then I turned and ran it was only a smile nothing more it didn't make everything all right it didn't make anything all right only a smile a tiny thing a leaf in the woods shaking in the wake of the startled bird's flight but I will take it with open arms because when spring comes it melts the snow one flake at time and maybe i just witnessed the first flake melted i ran a grown man running with a swarm of screaming children but i didn't care i ran with the wind blowing in my face and a smile as wide as the valley of punchshare on my lips i ran the end